Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Finally Whip Porn Podcast. Today I am joined by Daniel Lidman and I am really, really excited to talk to you today, Daniel, because you are the author of one of my favourite ever books, The Molecule of More. So thank you so much for joining me. You want to start off by introducing yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do, your background, and also The Molecule of More, and maybe the, the reason why you wrote the book. I think that would be interesting to listen to for a start. Sure thing. You know, it's it's a somewhat complicated question, uh, talking about your trajectory to where you are now and what made you decide to write a book. But um, right now, um, I am uh, the SVP for mental health at a telehealth company called Hims and Hers. I was in academia at George Washington University for 26 years, and I loved it. Um, I, I loved the teaching. I loved the research. I loved the patient care. I love doing all kinds of different things. But after a while, I began to notice that the innovation was shifting, that academia was not moving very fast. Um, there's a lot of layers of bureaucracy in academia, and there's an enormous weight of tradition as well. And, and that can be beautiful, and it can be helpful, but sometimes it doesn't meet the needs of patients. So I transitioned to um, Silicon Valley, California, where things move very, very fast uh, and working with some wonderful, brilliant people on trying to find ways to take this new technology and meet the growing needs for mental health care at a cost people can afford. Mm. Uh, I still teach uh, because I, I love that. Um, and so I continue to do a lot of different things. Um, I wrote The Molecule of More uh, very much out of my experience as an academic. As I was climbing the academic ladder, I was writing all kinds of peer-reviewed papers, um, review articles, textbook chapters, and you learn so much by writing these things. But one of the frustrations is that in many cases, very few people read them. So um, doing a study, writing up the results, getting it published, that can take years. And only a few dozen of your colleagues who are specialized in the same area that you are may end up reading it. So when I reached professor and I no longer had to run on that hamster wheel, I decided I'm going to write something that people are going to actually want to read. And um, dopamine had played a very large role in my career. Um, dopamine is responsible for a surprising variety of mental health problems. Uh, addiction, which we're going to talk about today, but also schizophrenia and attention deficit disorder. Um, I was an, an addiction specialist at the beginning of my career, and it kind of bothered me. Why is it that the molecule that is causing so much trouble for my patients also causes trouble for people with schizophrenia, ADHD, bipolar disorder, and other illnesses? And as I began to research that question, I stumbled upon some fascinating things that I didn't know, even as an addictions expert. And I thought this is something I need to share with the world. Yeah, I love that. And that's the amazing thing about the book is that it is so accessible because I don't come from a neuroscience background. You know, I would love to go to university and study neuroscience. However, you know, if you do kind of want to get a really solid understanding of the mean, but you don't want to go and read a load of academic studies, it's really, really good place to start, I think, with the molecule of law because you've packed so much research into that book and made it very accessible so that just your average person who isn't from a scientific background can access and understand how dopamine works and how it is so involved in addiction as well. And as I was just saying before we started, I think that's one of the things I just loved about the book so much is that you can gain a really understanding a really good understanding of how your brain works and maybe why you have been addicted to something like I was with pornography. And when you understand that and you can really, really see how dopamine works and see that in play in your own life, it can definitely alleviate some of the feelings of shame and feelings of there's something wrong with me or, you know, I've got this problem that's intrinsic to who I am. And instead you can kind of shift your focus to, okay, well, this is how dopamine works. There's no wonder I've ended up down this rabbit hole in the past. I don't need to go and figure out all this internal stuff about myself necessarily. Instead, actually, my brain has become addicted, and that's largely due to how dopamine works. 
in your work as an addiction specialist, what did you find in terms of working with people? How was that experience and how did dopamine play a part in the world of that? Yeah, so I, I really loved working uh, patients fighting working with patients uh, fighting addiction. Um, it's a war. It, it, the the drugs hijack some of the most influential circuits in the brain, and not only are they powerful, they're also surprisingly clever. And so, what I one of the things I enjoyed about the treatment was just you have to bring every tool to bear uh, to overcome this kind of wild beast and. And people understand that it can be powerful, but they don't understand how clever it can be. One example was I had a patient who was recently sober from alcohol, and he was loving his new life. And he thought, this is so great, I'm never going to go back. Nothing could possibly tempt me. One day, he's getting ready to drive home from work, and he goes, I've been driving the same route every day for years. Uh, I I'm having a new life. I'm just going to do something different, um, try new things takes a different route home from work. And just by coincidence, uh, the new route passes a bar that he used to go into. And he said, well, wow, I'm just going to say hello to the bartender. That's all. Good friend. See how he's doing. And of course, you know how the story ends. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we say in addictions is it's better to be smart than strong. You really need to develop strategies to outwit these circuits rather than trying to take them on head on. Yeah. So by that, do you mean not trying to use willpower, but instead finding a tool or a strategy so that you can proactively manage that desire when it comes up sometime in the future? Exactly. You know, people think that willpower is the tool that one uses when overcoming it, an addiction. That's, that's a bad, bad myth. Uh, willpower is very, very weak and um, it's almost useless. Um, I've had so many patients say, um, again, with alcohol, um, all my friends drink. All my socializing revolves around going to bars. So uh, I'll just order a Diet Coke. Uh, I'll be strong. I, I won't order a drink. And of course, that never works. Um, yeah. So a, a better strategy uh, is not to go into bars. Or, for example, if you have to go someplace where alcohol is being served, let's say uh, a work party that you can't avoid, uh, you get a sober buddy who stays by your side um, and... and and you're not going to rely on willpower. You're going to rely on your body. And and that works where willpower does not. Yeah. And talking about the addictive part of the mind being really, really smart, that is definitely something that I've found in the past. So in our program, we talk a lot about what we call junkie thinking. It's basically any excuse, rationalization, justification for someone who has addicted neural pathways to engage in the compulsive behavior. And we have found the addictive part of the mind to come up with some absolutely genius ways to convince the rational part of the mind to engage in the behavior like you say someone going and taking a different route to work just coincidentally and then ended up being in a bar because they want to talk to a barmaid and that's why it's not really interesting with the molecule of law is the reward prediction ever and how you have the anticipation of the reward and what i well what i understood and interpreted from the book is that dopamine is actually being released in that whole build-up. So the moment that he is walking into the bar, talking to a barmaid, am I right thinking that dopamine is being released at that point rather than when they're actually consuming the alcohol? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think it's helpful to take a step back and just think about the role of dopamine in um, broader terms. A and that is to, you know, I called it the molecule of more. The role of dopamine is to maximize future resources. Uh, in such a way that it meets the needs of our genes, and that is survival and reproduction. And so dopamine's job is always to make us look ahead. And uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, one of the things it does, as you pointed out, is it generates spontaneous thoughts. Now, sometimes these spontaneous thoughts are incredibly valuable. We talk about insights into problems that we were unable to figure out. We've all had the experience of being in the shower or drifting off to sleep, and suddenly an idea comes out of nowhere that solves a problem we've been working on um, with no luck. That's great, but spontaneous thoughts can also be extremely damaging, uh, and that's what you're talking about, uh, these thoughts that justify uh, these behaviors. And um, it's not because dopamine is evil. 
it's because dopamine is neutral and it's just pursuing its job of trying to maximize future success. And of course, in any organism, sexual reproduction is going to be playing an enormous role in that. Uh, and so um, it is going to be constantly making us crave sexual satisfaction, anticipate sexual satisfaction, and giving us rewards when we're acting in a way that's moving us toward that. Yeah, and is that because dopamine's responsibility, its job, as you say, it's neutral, but it is to pass on and replicate genes. And what I found really interesting is that the passing on of genes, you know, that is, I mean, it's about survival and, yeah, reproducing genes. And that is both, you know, your own genes and staying alive, so survival, of course, but then also reproduction and keeping your genes on to other people in the future. And then obviously the problem with pornography is that the reward circuitry is getting mixed up and thinking that you're passing on your genes because you're having this huge evolutionary reward of an orgasm. But the reality is with pornography, you're actually getting further away from reproducing if you are stuck in a porn addiction rather than closer to it. And that's because the the dopamine circuit is basically getting hijacked by this super stimulus. Yeah, you know, our brains evolved in a environment in which we were constantly on the brink of starvation, constantly on the brink of extinction. Uh, human beings almost went extinct. Uh, our population got down to a few tens of thousands at one point, uh, which is why there's a lot less genetic variation among humans than there are in our uh, great ape um, cousins, so to speak. Um, so we were on the brink of starvation and extinction. Um, and that's where, that's the environment in which the dopamine circuits evolved in. Now things are very different. With modern life, we found ways to gratify ourselves very, very, very easily. And uh, so in some ways, it's like taking an engine that's pushing a heavy load and you suddenly remove that load and zoom, it spins up out of control and sometimes absolutely flies apart. Um, when we were evolving, it took a lot of work to find a reproductive partner. Uh, it was a very, very big deal. Now, um, stimulating that circuit is just flipping on the computer. Uh, it takes a second, and so it's, it's that motor, that flywheel spinning without a load out of control. Yeah, and talking about fuel and engines, it reminded me of a, a metaphor or an analogy that you used in your book I mean, it's a totally different sort of uh, subject, really, but about airplanes and, or, or maybe it was a rocket. I can't remember, but it was about fuel going in sort of different directions and starting in the same place. So you have dopamine starting off in the ventral tegmental area, and then it can pass through to the mesolimbic or the mesocortical pathway. And I found that really interesting. I was wondering if you could share a bit more about that, because what I'm guessing with the pornography is like it's going through into the mesolimbic, the more primitive part of the brain, but there could be a way of getting into the mesocortical part of the brain instead and like re-engaging that prefrontal cortex with the right tools in that middle one that you have that craving. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. Um, in some ways, the solution for an out-of-control dopamine circuit uh, is to counteract it with a different dopamine circuit. Um, so when people think about dopamine, they usually think about the uh, mesolimbic circuit, which we call the desire circuit. Um, this is the one that makes us want things. It's the one that gives us excitement as we approach um, getting what it is that we're working for. But the problem with it is, is that it's very primitive and it just goes, goes, goes. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. So um, one of the things we haven't quite talked about or we just touched on that we need to think about a little bit more here is that dopamine is the molecule of the future. It's got nothing to do with the present. Um, and, and that's why in a lot of situations, things that we want so badly and we work so hard for, once we get it, we don't get the pleasure or the satisfaction that we expected. Now, this primitive desire circuit, it's looking forward a few seconds, a few minutes into the future. Um, I'd like a donut. Um, I would like uh, to buy something on Amazon or I would like to view pornography. There is a more sophisticated dopamine circuit, and that's one that involves the prefrontal cortex in human beings, the most evolved part of the human brain. And what that one does is it looks farther into the future, beyond seconds and minutes, 
weeks, months, even years. So, and I call that the control circuit. Um, that's responsible for things like long-term planning, manipulating abstract ideas like mathematics, the laws of nature, even thinking about things like justice and beauty. So the desire circuit might say, geez, I'd really like to have a donut. And the control circuit says, well, that might make us happy for the next 30 seconds, but it's going to be unhealthy. And so let's not do it. Um, and it's the same with pornography. The desire circuit says, I would like to consume some pornography. And the control circuit says, that's going to degrade the quality of your life long term. Let me help you come up with some strategies uh, to protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do and what why I teach is essentially trying to get people from that sort of mesolimbic or primitive part of the brain back into like the prefrontal cortex in those cravings. So we have a way of giving people this tool where we basically say, okay, you are going to walk on right now. The addictive neural pathways are going to create it. And that's just where we're at right now. So you're going to have that one thing. That's not going to change. We can't get rid of that one thing right away. And maybe we turn it over time as, you know, transcription practice like Bell Cosby and the brain changes essentially as you deal with it uh, effectively. And then what we do is we get them to really think about what is, but what are the consequences? You know, what is actually going to happen as you look at porn and try to think that through in that moment of craving. So I was wondering like, what are your thoughts on that? And what sort of tools I suppose have you used to help people with addiction in the past as well? Yeah. So I think that that is a wonderful strategy. Um, the mesocortical circuit, the control circuit, um, it, it is, is sort of cold and calculating. It's really good at figuring things out, but it's not going to give you motivation. And so I love what you're doing. You're saying, let's think about the consequences. Let's think about how this is having a negative impact on your life and how your life would be different, better, if you were able to overcome the addiction. So now you're actually taking the desire circuit that's driving the addiction um, and using it to undermine itself. So, all right, I, I don't just want to watch pornography. I also want to be healthy. I want to have better relationships in my life. Um, I, I want to feel better about myself, have greater self-esteem. So the first thing that you do is you try to uh, create a conflict within that desire circuit, and that will provide the motive force, the motive energy to drive things forward as you turn to the control circuit to start giving you strategies. Yeah, absolutely. So I think where a lot of people get it wrong, that it's obviously not a purpose, it's just there's not that much information out there. And I feel like your book and the information around those means is fairly new at this point. Um, but a lot of people, what I did in the past when trying to quit porn is I was always trying to get away from the wanting and escape the wanting or maybe delay it and sort of almost tease myself a little bit. I'd be spending a lot of time on social media, you know, just kind of scrolling or I'd go and watch some Netflix. So try and get around the desire whilst actually activating the dopamine desire circuit because really I was just building up to eventually looking at porn maybe hours later and I didn't know back then that all of that sort of self foreplay was really just me engaging in the addiction. Yeah, and in some ways social media and even Netflix are porn adjacent, right? Um, you scroll through social media, there's a lot of uh, sexually arousing material, even if there's not pictures of naked people, uh, there's a lot of um, titillating stuff. And, and of course on Netflix, um, sex sells. Uh, and, and so you're right. What you're doing is you're triggering cravings. You're making your cravings worse. Um, it, it's like an alcoholic lining up a bunch of alcohol in front of them and saying, well, maybe this will help me avoid drinking alcohol. It doesn't sound like a great strategy to me. Yeah, yeah exactly that. So if you were to have any advice or any recommendations based on all of your research, and I know we've touched on it already, but any overall message, I suppose, to anyone listening to this, they're struggling with porn, they really want to quit it, maybe they've been trying to quit for quite a while, what would you maybe say to them? Yeah, so I, I'd say the first thing is that they need to understand the complexity of the brain. Um, we tend to think of ourselves in a unified sense. 
Um, I, I'm the same now as I will be in 10 minutes, as I will be in 10 days. But in fact, the way we are fluctuates enormously uh, from minute to minute, hour to hour. And we see things in very different ways. And so one strategy that I like is um, have the healthy you try to communicate with the unhealthy you. So a lot of times uh, we feel very different about our porn consumption uh, immediately following masturbation. Uh, when somebody experiences sexual climax, it leads to a very significant modification of their neurotransmitter and hormonal milieu. Uh, and all of a sudden they might say, geez, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, that's the time to uh, write down your wisdom. Uh, write down how you feel. Uh, write down the influence. I, I mean, did it drop your energy? Um, did it make you feel ashamed of yourself? Did that feeling of shame drive you to the kitchen to go eat junk food? Uh, did it make you less interested in socializing in healthy ways? Write these things down. Um, and that's building up the desire to overcome it. Uh, maybe when you are starting to have, um, what, what did you call it? Some, I, I've heard the term stinking thinking. Uh, uh, thoughts that, yeah. What yeah, do you call junky it? Thinking. Junky thinking. Junky thinking. Yeah. yeah. When you start having junky thinking, you might open up these notes uh, and, and try to compare and contrast and say, what do I really want? So that's the first step. The first step is to get you to a place where you really, really want to change. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's exactly what I would recommend as well. <laughs> yeah, there's this old joke. Um, how many light bulb? I, I mean, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, <laughs> the answer is just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Yeah. Uh, right. so, so that's the first step. Once you're there, uh, then you shift. And then you start thinking about strategies. Then you bring in the control circuit. Uh, that is able to plan and strategize. Um, and, and I'm sure you have lots of strategies that, that you yeah. can recommend, like porn blockers or... Well, I'm actually quite... Uh, I have quite a strong standpoint on blockers. I'm quite against them, to be honest, only because what we say is we want to get people in the position where, as you say, they have that consequences list in their mind so ingrained that they know that they can always look at pornography. It's always there. There's no real way to actually deprive yourself of porn in this crazy world that we're now living in where it's absolutely everywhere. So what we've found is that blockers can actually, we're not like massively against them, I suppose, but what we've found is that they can create feelings of deprivation, which is where you really want something and then it is actually available, it is there, but you feel like it's being withheld from you. And from the evolutionary perspective, what we... We believe, and I don't have any academic research into this, so I, I admit that, but in the past, for so many years, people have really wanted something, and it, they actually have been deprived of it, you know, with food and just surviving in general, right? And so what we think is that people, by saying to themselves, I can't have something, or installing the blocker, actually creates these feelings of deprivation, which are these really, really horrible feelings where they do feel like they're on the drink of essentially dying. So, yeah, we found that quite interesting. So... What we do is, yeah, a remember letter. That's what we call it. It sounds exactly like what you were saying. It's where, you know, you really just sit down, get pen and paper, maybe have a coffee, whatever, and really just go and write down how you feel about this whole addiction, how it's, yeah, creating fears of shame, lack of energy, you're not pursuing what you really want in life. Write all of that down. And I think, yeah, doing that after maybe engaging in the porn and when you've just feeling really down and you've got that, that sort of, uh, you've had the orgasm, um, you know, that can be really beneficial. And in your book, you do talk about shifting from that one thing into, okay, well, now you've had it, so it changes, you know, the, the chemicals in your brain. Dopamine's gone, yeah. yeah. When the future becomes the present, dopamine shuts down. How does that work, actually? I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, let's say you have an orgasm, and then you finish, and, you know, you're not feeling very good, but then the cravings of porn will come back up not too long later. So I wonder how that works. Yeah. So um, let's think about, um, let's think about regular sex, healthy sex. Um, as you are um, thinking about having sex and then experiencing sexual arousal, uh, dopamine is very active. And that's because you are in a future oriented state. 
Uh, I am looking forward to what is about to happen. Um, as you uh, begin to have sex, um, dopamine continues to rise because you're looking forward to climax, having an orgasm. Uh, but also the here and now chemicals start to come in as well. And, and if we have time, I'd like to talk a little bit about them because I think they're important. Um, when orgasm actually occurs, uh, people tend to come into the present moment most fully. There's an interesting scientific experiment in which um, people, uh, their phone would beep at random times per day, and they had to write in what they were doing and whether they were thinking about what they were doing or their mind was wandering to something else. And uh, they found that the activity that was most consistently associated to thinking about what you're doing uh, was experiencing an orgasm. Um, so uh, tragically, some people's minds do wander uh, during orgasm. And, and I suspect that that's probably more likely to happen with people with porn addictions. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, as you mentioned earlier, when we were speaking, you develop tolerance. Um, ordinary sexual depictions just don't do it for you anymore. Uh, and, and so maybe you're fantasizing about some extreme kink um, and you're not in the present moment with your partner. Yeah. Um, so, so dopamine can give us a lot of pleasure, but it's a particular kind of pleasure. It's a future-oriented pleasure that is characterized by excitement and anticipation. But there are other chemicals in the brain that also give us pleasure, different kinds of pleasure. Um, and, and I think the one that a lot of people can relate to is endorphin. That's the body's version of opioids. That's responsible for um, the runner's high. And, and if you've ever had this feeling of being high after a big workout, it's very much in the here and now, right? It's not my life is going to be great because I got a raise or I saw a pretty girl. It's I am just happy and content right now in the present moment. Very different from dopamine pleasure. Uh, another one is oxytocin. Uh, and that's when you're just hanging out with someone you like uh, and, and the here and now pleasure of just being with someone. Yeah. So um, when, you have, when you have a healthy orgasm with a partner that you care about, um, the dopamine is replaced by all these here and nows. And if you're able to get into that moment, it, it can be very lovely. Uh, women have an easier time of it. And, and so women will discuss the postcoital uh, period after sex it, it, it's being so pleasant they they many of them everyone's different but many of them like to snuggle uh they like to have intimate conversations a little bit tougher for men um but people who are trying to overcome an addiction really need to cultivate their ability to experience this other kind of pleasure pleasure in the here and now just enjoying what you have uh whether it's the beauty of nature around you whether it's savoring the flavors of a good meal or savoring the joys of talking to someone that you care about. Um, you can't replace the pleasure of pornography with nothing. You've got to replace it with something. Uh, and the here and now pleasures are going to be the ones that are going to let you be most successful. Yeah, I love that. And I had a client who said, he asked me, Okay, so what do you do now? Because you're not looking at porn, you're not browsing the internet, you're not on Netflix or social media, you're not doing those things anymore. Like, how do you like spend your time? And when you're in that addictive pathway, all you can think about is sort of other dopamine-based uh, sort of activities. Well, it's about the future. It's about like wanting and doing, and maybe like scrolling or whatever it is. But I said to him, well. This morning, you know, I went for a walk and I had a coffee, but yeah, I just really liked going for a walk, nice park, look at the trees, maybe spend some time with some friends or just sit and tidy up my apartment. I, I don't know, whatever it is, it's like, you know, just being present, it's fine. You don't need it anymore. You know, 30 years ago, there was no online porn, social media and Netflix and, and people had no difficulty filling up their life with enjoyable things. Uh, see what they were doing 30 years ago and see if any of that looks like fun. Yeah, that's a great start. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you so, so much again for coming on. I've loved speaking to you. Um, I do have another question actually about erectile dysfunction. Actually, can we just quickly cover that? Because 
what you were saying there, I, I'm really intrigued. I think that could be helpful to people quickly as well. Yeah, quick disclaimer, uh, I, I'm not a urologist, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'll do my best. Yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to ask about erectile dysfunction and how that can come up. And if that's to do with, you know, you're in that sort of dopamine circuit, you want it in the more, you've got all the craving, and then it's that that can actually get in the way, ironically, of the enjoyment of the actual sex and going ahead and, and you know, having sex with somebody because then you're shifting from that dopamine circuit into the here and now chemicals because maybe you're like with the girl or, or the guy, you know, you're actually getting quite intimate and then different chemicals are being released and then how that could potentially lead to erectile dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. Um, so erectile dysfunction can be caused by physical factors or psychological factors. And I think what we're talking about here are the psychological factors. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, there there can be, the, I, I think that, you know, I, I read this quotation um, from a young man in Japan. I, I think pornography addiction is particularly a problem in Japan and their population is falling dramatically because nobody wants to get married and have children. The young man said, I... I actually prefer uh, pornography to real women uh, because the pornography never says no and the pornography never asks anything of me. Um, and, and so in some ways, I think it's like if you've been eating potato chips and cupcakes, um, a healthy meal doesn't look that appealing, um, especially if it takes a lot of work to prepare that healthy meal. It's much easier to just rip open a bag of crisps, as I guess you guys say. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with pornography. Um, it, it, it's scary. Uh, the woman might not like you. Uh, she might not be satisfied by you. Um, she's not going to do the kinky things uh, that the women in the pornography videos do. Uh, and, and maybe you've developed so much tolerance that you can't get excited from just ordinary um, sex. So, um, I do think that that's a problem and, and it, it's, it's ironic and tragic, uh, because the very people who need to be going out seeking healthy relationships are handicapped by their addiction. Yeah. Big time. So I would definitely recommend to anyone just prioritize overcoming this addiction and that is going to significant, significantly increase your chances, I think, of getting into those here and now chemicals and the endorphins and serotonin. Yeah. And as a physician, I, I would say, you know, if you're worried about erectile dysfunction, why don't you go ahead and try and take some of that medication? Uh, it's not a long-term solution. You shouldn't need it with psychological rather than um, physical reasons for erectile dysfunction. But if it'll give you the confidence uh, to go ahead and give it a try, uh, maybe after four or five uh, episodes of using it, you won't need it anymore because you're no longer so nervous. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. Okay, so where can people find you? And do you want to mention your books as well? Because I know you've got a new one out that I'm reading at the moment. I'm really enjoying so far too. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so my, um, my website is danielzlieberman.com. Uh, I don't do a lot of social media. I've got very mixed feelings about it. A lot, lot of good things about it. A lot of not so good things as well. Um, and yeah, I recently uh, wrote a book called Spellbound. It's about the unconscious mind and its links to ancient traditions of the supernatural. And I, I found it an absolute joy to write because it, it links all kinds of fascinating stuff about magic and fairy tales and myths uh, with neuroscience and, and brings them together in what I think is a fascinating way. Yeah, I'm loving it so far. So yeah, thank you for that. And thanks for writing about the Cure for Love because it's really genuinely helped me a lot. So keep doing what you're doing. I really do appreciate it. And thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you found this useful and enjoyable. Uh, go check out the Monocume of More, highly recommend it. And also Daniel's new book, Spellbound, as well. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.